guard the good deposit entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Guarding the deposit of faith is the mission which the Lord has entrusted to his church and which she fulfills in every age. This treasure, received from the apostles, has been faithfully guarded by their successors. All Christ faithful are called to hand it on from generation to generation by professing the faith, by living it in fraternal sharing, and by celebrating it in liturgy and prayer. What the church teaches about Mary is directly related to and follows upon what the church believes about her son. And when we think about the Christian faith, we are an incarnational faith. We believe that God himself took on a human nature to himself, and therefore we honor the, his mother, Mary. When we think about Mary, there are two extremes that we have to avoid. One is that we have to avoid making Mary a divine person and worshiping her. We don't believe that. Mary was not a divine person. She was a human person. But the other extreme is to denigrate or reduce the role of Mary. Mary is not just a very good person or a very holy person. She's much more than that. She is the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we honor her for that. And, for, and because of that, we hold Mary in great esteem for three principal reasons. First, and most importantly, she is the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, she is a powerful intercession, intercessor for us who lives now in heaven and is, is interested in us and intercedes for us with the Father. And then finally, she is a powerful model for us of holiness and, and the mother of the church. And for those reasons, we hold Mary in great honor and esteem. We don't worship her, but we hold her in great, great honor. Mary's role in our salvation goes back to the beginning of the human race. We read this in the so-called Proto-Evangelium in Genesis, the third chapter of verse 15, when God is addressing Satan and says that he will put enmity between him and the woman, who is, who is the offspring of the human race, that, that the enmity will extend between Satan's offspring and Mary's offspring, the woman's offspring, and that is Jesus, of course. This goes back to the very beginning of the human race. The history of Israel is really a preparation for the birth of the mother of our Savior, Mary. The Immaculate Conception is one of the four principal Marian doctrines that the Church teaches. This has been held since the beginning of Christianity. It was only officially given as a doctrine, or a do as a dogma, uh, in the year 1854, when Pope Pius IX declared that the Blessed Virgin Mary was from the first moment of her conception by a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God, and by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, preserved immune from all stain of original sin. And what this means is that Mary was prepared for her role by a unique grace from God. That she was preserved free from original sin. And we also know that she was free from sin throughout her life. Mary was a perfect human vessel for Christ. This doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of Mary is critically important when we consider her son, free from sin. Mary's holiness comes from the merits of her son. Mary was saved by her son before her birth or even his birth. We call this prevenient grace. This is a 
saving action of Christ, who is beyond time and space, who saved Mary free from original sin. The fathers of the church have declared this throughout the history of the church, that she is, was called all holy, the panagia in the Eastern Orthodox tradition of our church. Mary's role in our salvation is related to her willingness and her openness to God to say yes. We call that her fiat. It's because of Mary's cooperation in the divine plan that our Savior was born. When God himself planned to save the human race, he needed cooperation of a human being in this plan to give Jesus his humanity. Mary was open to God's plan from the very beginning. The Saint Irenaeus says, the knot of Eve's disobedience was untied by Mary's obedience. What the virgin Eve bound through her disbelief, Mary loosened by her faith. Why do we call Mary the mother of God? It has everything to do with who her son is. Jesus is the son of God. Mary was his mother, and therefore she is the mother of God. In Greek, we call this the Theotokos, or the God-bearer. This comes from two ecumenical councils. First, in the year 325 at the Council of Nicaea, where the Arian heresy was being refuted, the divinity of Jesus Christ was firmly established. And then the doctrine of Mary being the mother of God was firmly established at the Council of Ephesus in the year 431, when the council declared that mother of God, not that the nature of the word or his divinity received the beginning of his existence from the Holy Virgin, but that since the holy body animated by a rational soul was the word of God united to himself according to the hypostasis, born from her the word is said to be born according to the flesh. In other words, Mary is the mother of Jesus, who is God himself. From the very beginning of the church, the first formulations of the church confessed that Jesus was conceived solely by the power of the Holy Spirit, without the need for human seed. In other words, God himself in the person of the Holy Spirit is Jesus' father, while Mary gives him his human nature. This has been confessed from the earliest creeds of the church. St. Justin Martyr, writing in the very first part of the second century, said, faith in the virginal conception of Jesus met with lively opposition, mockery, or incomprehension of non-believers, Jews and pagans alike so that it could hardly have been motivated by pagan mythology or by some adaptations to the ideas of the age. This was a stumbling block for non-believers, but it is crucial for us because Mary's virginal motherhood is a guarantor of Jesus's divinity and his humanity. Mary's virginity manifests God's absolute initiative in the incarnation. The Holy Spirit took the initiative to become the father of Jesus Christ. In what sense do we mean that Mary was always a virgin? Well, St. Augustine says that Mary is ever virgin in the sense that she remained a virgin in conceiving her son, a virgin giving birth to him, a virgin carrying him, a virgin in nursing him at her breast, always a virgin. The liturgy of the church celebrates Mary as the aparthenos, the ever virgin mother of God. What about these references to the so-called brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ? According to the Old Testament, the word Adelphus is used to mean kinsman. For example, we read that in the book of Tobit, where the kinspeople of the Jews are called Eldelphoi. It can be neighbor. We read that from Matthew's Gospel. It can mean 
half-brother. When we read that regarding Herod, uh, it can mean relative. And we read that in Genesis itself, in, uh, verse, uh, in, in chapter 29, verse 12, where Jacob was told that Rachel, what he was his father's kinsperson. Again, a Belfoy. So that doesn't mean that Jesus had brothers and sisters, or that Mary had other children. In fact, what all it means is that these are somehow his relatives. It may be cousins, it may be half-brothers, it may be some other way, even a kinsperson. We simply don't know. The Greek word doesn't tell us. Mary's only son was Jesus who came to save the human race. In that respect, she is our mother as well. Mary stands obediently with her son, the new Adam, and she is the new Eve. She's mother of all the living. Mary, with a mother's love, cooperates in the new birth of us in our baptism, in our confirmation. At once, virgin and mother, Mary is a symbol and the most perfect realization of the church. The church, by receiving the word of God in faith, becomes herself a mother. By preaching and baptism, she brings forth sons who are conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of God to a new and immortal life. She herself is a virgin who keeps in its entirety and purity the faith she has pledged to her spouse. The Blessed Virgin Mary is the mother of the church in order of grace because she gave birth to Jesus, the Son of God, who is head of the body, the church. The church is the body of Christ. Christ is the head of the church. And his mother is Mary. So she is the mother of the entire church. And Mary's role is inseparable from her union with her son, Jesus Christ. The union of Mary and the church is made manifest at the hour of the cross, when, as Jesus is dying, he says to his beloved disciple, behold your mother. What Jesus was doing was giving Mary to us as our mother, the mother of all who are believers in her son, Jesus Christ. The Virgin Mary is a powerful helper to us. She is our mother. When you consider Jesus' first miracle in the wedding at Cana, where the couple ran out of wine, what happened? Well, Mary told them to do whatever her son asked of them. She was there with the first disciples, helping them, beginning with her prayers, to aid the beginnings of the church. When the course of Mary's earthly life was finished, she was assumed bodily into heaven. We call that her glorious assumption. This was, this was given to us as a dogma by Pope Pius XII, who said that when the course of her earthly life was finished, the Virgin Mary was taken up body and soul into heavenly glory and exalted by the Lord as queen over all things. The assumption of the Blessed Virgin is a singular participation in her son's resurrection and an anticipation of the resurrection of other Christians. The faithful see Mary as an image and an anticipation of the resurrection of all of us. Mary, after the course of her earthly life, is now in heaven with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And she lives there to intercede for us now on earth. The Assumption of Mary has also been noted in the Eastern Church, where we call this the Dormition of Mary. In giving birth, you kept your virginity. In your Dormition, you did not leave the world, O Mother of God, but were joined to the source of life. You conceived the living God, and by your prayers will deliver souls from death. Mary is a model of the Christian life. And by her complete obedience to the will of God, 
She is a model for us in obeying the will of God. In a wholly singular way, she cooperated with obedience, faith, hope, and burning charity in the Savior's work of restoring supernatural life to our souls. For this reason, she is a mother to us in the order of grace. Taken up to heaven, she did not lay aside the saving office, but by her manifold intercession continues to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. Therefore, the Blessed Virgin is invoked in the church under the titles of advocate, helper, benefactress, and mediatrix. Mary's function as mother of men in no way obscures or diminishes the unique mediation of Christ, but rather shows its power. Her salutary influence on men flows forth from the, her, the superabundance of the merits of Christ, rest on his mediation, depends entirely on it, and draws all his power from it. Just as the priesthood of Christ is shared in various ways, both by his ministers and the faithful, so also the unique mediation of the Redeemer does not exclude, but rather gives rise to a manifold cooperation, which is but a sharing in this one source. We have great devotion to the Virgin Mary for several reasons. From the most ancient times, the Blessed Virgin has been honored with the title, the Mother of God. It's important to realize and to recognize that we don't worship Mary. She's not a divine person, but we hold her with great honor. We honor Mary in a very different way than we honor the Holy Trinity. We worship the Holy Trinity. We honor Mary. We venerate Mary for her role in our salvation. It's not worship, but it is honor and veneration. In our liturgy, throughout the liturgical year, we honor Mary for her role in our salvation, for her saying yes to God's plan for our salvation, for her giving birth to our Savior, for her intercession for us, for a glorious assumption into heaven where she intercedes for us. For that reason, we hold her with great veneration, but we don't worship her. We honor Mary in a variety of ways. We honor her in prayer, most typically in the Holy Rosary, which is a compendium of the whole gospel, where we see the life of Jesus through Mary's participation. Mary is the eschatological icon of the church. Looking upon Mary, who is completed holy and already glorified in body and soul, the church contemplates in her what she herself is called to be on earth, and what she will become in the homeland of heaven. The mother of Jesus and the glory which she already possesses in body and soul in heaven is the image and beginning of the church as it is to be perfected in the world to come. Likewise, she shines forth on earth until the day of the Lord shall come, a sign of certain hope and comfort to the pilgrim people of God. 